Hey y'all, we are so excited to be back for our second episode ever of The Period Feels. I know it might be a little bit annoying when we do that, but you know, we are of the TikTok generation. So every time we say The Period Feels together, we have to let, you know, we hear the material girl sound. Um, if you know, you know. Uh, and so now that's just going to be a thing until like it's too cringy for everybody. Anyways, um, I'm Nadia. I'm Nettie. And I'm Sam. And we're your co-hosts for today's episode of our podcast. So um, we're just going to start by talking a little bit about how the week has been. How are y'all? I feel good. Last week, I feel like there were so many different things that happened. Like we had shoots and then we're like sold out. Well, not anymore. (laughs) But so that was like a mess. But I feel good this week. I feel like I have a lighter workload this week. Ooh, also exciting. Our team member, Claudia, was in from Canada coming to visit, so we took her around New York. She came with us to our shoot, and it was super fun. Also, our shoot was with a model that we sourced from TikTok. Like, we were like, make a video, tag us, hashtag AugustHQ if you want to model for us. She made us a video and came in and modeled, and it was amazing. It's like one of our most iconic shoots yet, I think. I think it's always fun when, like, we say we're going to do, like, a TikTok open casting call, and then we actually meet someone from it, and, I mean, this isn't the first time, too, right? Like, Elena, who's our full-time team member, uh, we also met her on TikTok. Like, we had said, if you want us to repost or do content collaboration, um, and she made this really cute video, I think, to the Dancing Queen sound. It was, like, her doing, like, (laughs) a dance, and then we were, like, come into the office and make... We need like ads for TikTok. Like, yeah. so just like showing how absorbent our pads are. We can't be like she came in, hung out with us, and then like two months later, we were looking to hire someone, and we just hit her up like, "Hey, she remember her? so well. Remember though. us? That's like the thing about our team. I feel like everyone just like naturally like flowed in. Mm-hmm. Yeah." yeah. And I mean, this is also a a big week because we welcomed a new team member to our team as well, who we have not met yet because um, COVID. Um, (laughs) She literally got COVID (laughs) week one, unfortunately, but she's getting better and she's been very good about social distancing. Um, But we welcomed a new team member, which is super exciting, named Erin, who's also our first non-Gen Z team member. Whoa. Whoa. (laughs) I think before she came in, we were like, wow, we're like a real company. Like, (laughs) we have like... Like, not to say adult supervision, but, like, kind of. She's, like, professional. She's professional. Yeah. And we're, like, giggling. Like, hey, hey. she's, like, she's, she's seen some stuff, too. She's, like, worked at actual, like, large companies. Right. Too, and she's coming and bringing in experience that, like, it's very welcomed and we're happy to have an adult in the room, I think. Yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. super excited. Um, just like we are happy to have adults in the room when we make this podcast, because otherwise we'd be rambling all the time. <laughs> Um, anyways, uh, I think some other highlights are that like we, now that we're restocking and people are like starting to get the products again, after a little bit of a hiatus, we're getting some like great feedback. So I've seen more videos of people doing the videos of the pad wrappers melting in hot water. Um, we also did our first in-person meetup in New York city and got to meet some people in person and we demonstrated how our pad wrappers melt in hot water, uh, which was also really cute. And Nettie, uh, I also wanted to see if you might be interested in sharing the very, very fun email we got this week. Let me bust out my phone. <laughs> Which I had to hide behind me for the podcast. This is like second. amazing, okay. this email. Yeah, we're um, again, we're not scientists on this. Or um, doctors slash, it's too random of an email to be lies, we think. Yeah. But this yeah. is a crazy story submitted from someone, like a, a subscriber of August. Um, her name is Ashley. And this is, I'm just going to read the whole yeah. email. <laughs> Hi, August team. I just wanted to share a story of how your tampon slash pad saved my puppy's life. I have an eight-month-old puppy who ate the entire bathroom garbage that had weeks' worth of period products in there. (laughs) She had to have her stomach pumped, but she ate so much that she passed passed garbage for a week. Because August is biodegradable, she didn't get a blockage and did not need surgery, and the products were able to pass through her system with ease. I used one non-August liner and it was fully intact while the other August products broke down. So thank you so much. You kept my puppy from needing surgery. Best products ever. This is wild. So like, wild. Like, Come on. <laughs> the evidence is there. There was one intact liner that was no, not yeah. ours. <laughs> we also got some other exciting news with Nettie. Your new kitchen. I don't want to say toy kitchen contraption it's kind of a toy my ad- it's kind of compost like a little bit it, i mean i asked for it for my birthday so i guess it has toy vibes okay <laughs> yeah it is a um at home composter um it takes five to eight hours to break down like 
like it can break down uh, wrappers and compostable um, cutlery and things, not just food. And it just kind of runs overnight, gets really hot, and you put a pot in there, and then you get like a basket of soil in the morning, basically, well, fertilizer. Um, and that was kind of the first time that I put our compostable wrappers in a compost where all of us could pull it out and see like, oh my gosh, it's gone. It is mm-hmm. part of this right. like soil. I put it in my, my roommate's plant. I'm super excited about it. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say. No, I, that, but it was kind of cool to see. Because not that I was like skeptical, but it was nice to actually put it in there and be like, ta-da, here you go. It's soil. It's literally <laughs> <Yeah>. soil. <laughs> I think it's really cool to see and and yeah I think it's it's been a fun week because we're you know finally over the hump of things being stuck at customs and being back in it and we're super excited because we're in studio uh recording this episode and as all of you know we're gonna really build every episode of the period feels around a question from our community so we have our inner cycle community which you can join on our website at itsaugust.co and we are sourcing questions directly from community members and here's are one for this week. Hey August, my name is Asta. I'm 24 years old and I live in Snohomish, Washington. I've been experiencing some really painful periods and I've noticed a lot of influencers I follow to have talked about endometriosis and I'm curious if that could be something that maybe I'm experiencing. If you could talk a little bit more about this and how to diagnose yourself, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Oof. Okay. Great question. First of all, I just want to ask, do any of you have endometriosis? I don't have endometriosis. I have cousins who have endometriosis though, like stage four endometriosis. Yeah. I didn't even know there were stages. No, I yeah, thought it there was are just stages. You don't. <laughs> there are stages, but I like, I get really bad period pain, but I don't have like diagnosed endometriosis. Do you have bad period pain? Um, actually Sam and I too manage our period pain, use a very common um, we use a TENS machine, which yeah. is very commonly used for endometriosis. Um, and I, we think that's super helpful. So I, uh, while I don't have endometriosis, I do really like my TENS machine. Yeah, the TENS machine pain. is like the best thing yeah. since like They're sliced in, bread. Yeah. <laughs> sliced bread? <laughs> like, um, for those of you who don't know what a TENS machine is, it's essentially just a little contraption where the stickers uh, send like electric... Like waves, jolts, jolts yeah. into your yeah. cramps and it just engages the muscles and it kind of relaxes them. So it relieves that muscle tension and mm-hmm. the cramps. And it's actually really exciting because I feel like we've been trying out so many different ones mm-hmm. and choosing what we like and don't like. And also thinking about like how we innovate on those with August. Cause as you know, we're always obsessed about product development as well, mm-hmm. but as I'm sure you can tell from the last two minutes of us talking about this and reacting to the question, we don't really have any idea about what we're talking about with endometriosis. And that's kind of the vibe of the period feels, which is we have a lot of the same questions that you do. And I think for us, we just really come here to be like, okay, yeah, let's put the questions out in the open and like react to it. Right. And I think that endometriosis for me, at least, um, like as someone who's been in the period advocacy space for a long time is that this is an issue that I'm hearing more and more about because of the magnitude of how many people experience it, right? Like the majority of menstruators will will have period pain, but like endometriosis is like a whole different level. And our community member who asked the question today was asking about like, if you can self-diagnose endometriosis. And from my understanding, you cannot because it's actually a very internal thing. Um, But I do know that there are signs of when you should talk to your doctor and we'll talk a little bit today um, and, you know, also do some interviewing to figure out the right answers and get all of this verified. Um, But to start, like, let's just out of curiosity, look at what endometriosis is if you Google it. Okay, I typed in define endometriosis to Google and I got this quote. A condition resulting from the appearance of endometrial-like tissue outside the uterus and causing pelvic pain. Okay. I mean... Okay, but see, the the thing that, like, I know to be true about endometriosis is that every time you say anything about endometriosis, there's, like, ten different opinions on it. So also to preface, like, we are learning along with you, and um, we know that there are a lot of different paths to diagnosis and a lot of things that may work for someone and may not work for others. Um, Ruby, who is our um, education and social media director, like she 
is every time she posts anything at all about endometriosis, she gets fired back with like 10 different opinions yeah. on everything. So even when I hear that, like even though we read like a Google definition, I know someone listening is gonna be like, no, 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 like it's right. actually yeah. like this and that. So it's almost like I'm scared to comment about it, but I think that's why we need to have more conversations about it as well. Yeah. I feel like a lot of the conversation that I see or like hear about around endometriosis is a lot of menstruators going in and seeing the doctor saying they have really terrible period pain and then like a doctor like giving them birth control or just being like you just have bad cramps like that's mm -hmm. it and then they have to keep going back to different doctors and constantly getting turned away and then finding out that they have endometriosis like years later um yeah so i feel like that's most of the conversation that i've heard around endometriosis yeah and which is another why i think reason why i think we wanted to talk about and answer questions like yeah. this which is like even though we're not doctors it's important for us to even know what you know these symptoms are and what these conditions are so that like we can advocate for ourselves and advocate for others and i think that i mean like when I see this Google definition, right, if I really, really think about it, I'm like, okay, maybe I kind of understand it, right? Like endometrial-like tissue, right? Like technically your period is when the endometrium is shedding from the uterus. So then to me, I'm like, so does this mean the endometrial tissue is growing outside of it, right? Like it's a confusing definition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But okay, so then I clicked on some other things and I looked at what the World Health Organization had to say. And they said, quote, it is a chronic disease associated with severe life impacting pain during periods, sexual intercourse, bowel movements and or urination, chronic pelvic pain, abdominal bloating, nausea, fatigue, and sometimes depression, anxiety, and fertil infertility. That's a lot. Yeah, but see, the thing <laughs> about that is like, if you read that description off, it could be PCOS. It could yeah, be like this right. and that. And that's like the problem with all of these disorders is even like a doctor will admit to you, like we won't actually know unless you go under the knife and we go have a look, which like is the insane. laparoscopic surgery. Yeah, like yeah, you have to yeah. fully like get surgery to know because those symptoms could be like a multitude of like period disorders, which is terrifying. It's just terrifying. That's so scary. <laughs> I feel like this also like this is why there is so much fear around periods and like period pain, which is like, okay, say I'm someone you know, even our community member who asked, right? Like I'm gonna Google around about endometriosis. I think I might have endometriosis. Wait. I'm nauseous, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, which is like most young people right. and humans in general. Especially on your period. Oh, and yeah. it causes infertility, right? Like I think it's like yeah. infertility also is just such a, you hear that word so many times if you look up anything about period pain, mm -hmm. right? Like period pain, wait, infertility, but if I use birth control, could that cause, like there's so much misinformation. Right. I do think though, like what is staggering to me when I started doing even like my own uh, research around endometriosis is just like how common it is, right? Like mm -hmm. we hear every day from community members about period pain. I mean, even sitting, we all experience, experience period pain at different levels and like endometriosis technically, according to different global studies, affects roughly 10% of reproductive age women and girls, and which is about 190 million people. But I think that what's crazy about this is that that number is probably way smaller than it should be because of the you know lack of understanding of what endometriosis is, and we don't talk about it, we don't learn about it. And so, and like we don't speak about periods as openly, so that's probably very much underdiagnosed, right? Mm -hmm. I'm curious, like when y'all learned about endometriosis, like is this something you learned about in health class? No. I didn't learn about it in health class. I learned it when like my cousin found out she had endometriosis, but I was like, what is that? Like I had no idea what it was, but I always like remember her saying how like she couldn't go out, like because she had her period and like it hurt so bad and like she like missed school for like weeks and like all this like really terrible like pain and stuff like that so I remember like that's when I learned about it because I was like what is she going through but I never learned about it in health class like ever <laughs> I kind of like took a deep dive when I knew that we were going to be like recording this episode and I just like went on TikTok just to see what the general conversation around endometriosis is and I was almost like is this a, like it's crazy to me that there's a movement like period pain is not normal like you should find a doctor that listens to you i'm like we need a, a movement to find a doctor that's right. listening to you because most people go to the doctor and say i have period pain and they're like take this birth control and some tylenol and go to bed and i'm like it's crazy that some like people doctors are making a movement out of like come to me i will listen to you i'm like that's the bare minimum <laughs> if yeah, you come yeah. in for like extreme period pain like that's the least your doctor can be doing which was kind of crazy actually to think about 
I don't know. (laughs) I think that it's also, it just illuminates how much like we as menstruators have accepted like being in pain, right? Yeah. Like when you when you ask like m- young menstruators who haven't gotten their period yet, like what they know about periods, it's like they know that they're gonna feel sick, they know they're gonna be bloated, they're gonna feel sad hungry. and yeah, hungry, <laughs> and then they know it'll be really painful, right? Yeah. And so I think that it's like it's hard to even have language or even you know to know like what does it mean to self-diagnose or how much pain is too much pain, mm-hmm. right? Like I feel like if you're just getting your period for your first time and you hear a stabbing pain, you're kind of like oh, well, everybody said it was going to hurt. And there's no barometer of, like, how much it really hurts. Mm -hmm. I think what's also fascinating is, like, when you talk about, like, levels of pain and, like, the history of menstruators' pain being so dismissed as just, like, cramps or, like, a part of just Mm -hmm. being, you know, having your period, it also just intersects so deeply with, like, race and things like that and, like, how pain is Mm -hmm. dismissed as well, which I'm really excited to hear more about as well. So since we're clearly not experts on endometriosis, I'm going to sit down with some representatives from the Endo Fund and also Sam, who's a TikToker, um, Sam X Endo, who has endometriosis. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam, your host on The Period Feels. And today we have a special, special guest, our first guest, our special first guest, Sam from Sam X Endo on TikTok and Sam Dot Endogram on Instagram. So our whole episode today is about endometriosis, and Nadia, Nettie, and I we have some gaps in our knowledge of endometriosis. So we thought it would be incredible to have you on because we know um, you experience endometriosis firsthand and you have so much experience and knowledge on it. So we thought that would be awesome. So do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us a bit about your journey. Um, We'd love to hear more. Yeah. So first of all, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to chat with you guys more about endometriosis. Um, So yes, I'm an endo warrior. Um, I'm 22 years old. I live in Southern California. Um, I was diagnosed with endometriosis when I was um, 19 years old. So pretty young. Um, Took me about seven years to get a full diagnosis. Um, It was definitely a tough journey, but here I am. Now I use that um, story to basically just spread awareness for the disease and hopefully help people out um, and make people feel like they have a community. So that's that's a little bit about me. I love that. (laughs) Yeah, on your TikTok, like, everything was so digestible and so easy to learn and it's so it's it's so easier to learn from someone who's also a gen z because all the language out there is like so hard to understand so we really appreciate you for doing all of that so you said that it took you seven years to get a proper diagnosis what is up with that what what do you mean Well, there's a lot of different things that factor into it. Basically, there is um, an average wait time to get a diagnosis for endometriosis. It's like eight to 10 years on average, which is horrible, like unacceptable. Um, But it really is just, um, it's first of all, just hard to diagnose in general. Like scans don't really show it. Um, It's pretty much only definitively diagnosed through surgery. Um, and the surgery itself is, you know, kind of hard to get because there's not a lot of specialists out there that know how to perform the surgery, um, specifically excision surgery. So um, it was definitely difficult. Um, there's also a lot of like medical gaslighting that factors into it. A lot of people have a hard time getting doctors to like take their concerns seriously. A lot of them deal with being dismissed. Um I definitely dealt with that. A lot of doctors basically told me my symptoms were normal um, in my head due to stress um, or just part of being like a woman. Um, So it was definitely really difficult to get a diagnosis. And I'm not alone in that. (laughs) It's like the normal. So. (laughs) Right. So did you just have like, like what were your symptoms, would you say? Yeah. So my symptoms started when I was like 13. Um, That's like around the time I got my first period. Um, and basically I just had really heavy and like debilitating periods. Um, I was throwing up from pain. I couldn't go to school. Um, I couldn't participate in sports. Um, and my mom just thought it was like totally weird that I was experiencing that because she didn't have like a bad period like that at all. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, 
that those were my first symptoms. Um, and then over time, it kind of progressed. Um, I started to develop like pain with intercourse, pain with bowel movements and urination, um, fatigue, food sensitivities, digestion issues, um, insomnia, um, and lower back pain and leg pain. That was like a really common thing with me. And I honestly thought it was like normal. Um, but yeah, those were like my main symptoms, I would say. Right, right. Oh my God, that sounds crazy. So, yeah. <laughs> so you went to a doctor and then they kind of like told you that it was just regular period pain, like nothing to like be scared about or anything. So you kept going back to different doctors and what, so what was like the turning point? Like what happened with like your last doctor that was like, no, this is like serious. Yeah. So like you said, I went back and forth with doctors. They were all giving me different answers. None of them were helpful at all. Um, and it wasn't until I developed an ovarian cyst, um, that I actually started to get some attention, but even then they were hesitant to even look further into it. They kind of told me like, Oh, you know, people get ovarian cysts all the time. It's normal, nothing to worry about. But, um, I decided to go to a different doctor after that. Um, and that was like a month from the first initial scan. And within that month, my cyst had tripled in size. Um, so that doctor was like, Oh, you have cancer. So you need an emergency surgery. Um, but it ended up being endometriosis. And that's kind of like how I got my diagnosis. Without that cyst, I probably still would have not had my diagnosis, which is really sad that it had to get to that's that point. Terrifying. <laughs> that's so scary. Yeah. So you use TikTok now to kind of educate everyone and kind of use your voice to be this like source for endometriosis. How did that all start? Yeah. So, um, once I got my diagnosis, I was just desperate to find other people like me and get solid answers because, you know, I didn't really understand what it was. I had not heard of it before I even got diagnosed with it. Um, which is really sad. Like, you know, it affects one in 10 people with a uterus. We should know that, you know, we should be taught that in schools. It should be part of sex education. But for me, I had never heard of it before. So, I was trying to look for people like me to build a community with, get some questions answered, um, and just, you know, feel out their experiences. Um, and that's when I came across um, other endo warriors on Instagram talking about their journeys. Um, and it just made me feel validated um, for like the first time ever. So I was like, God, I have to get like in this. This is awesome. Um, so at first it was really just for me to make friends. Um, I didn't really like think much of it. I was like, this is just me trying to cope with this, you know, new, um, diagnosis. Um, but it quickly turned into like anger that I had for me and all the other warriors in the community of just the hard, you know, life that we have to live, um, how hard it is to get diagnosed or get doctors to listen to us and how little awareness there is about it. Um, so it quickly turned into me just like using that anger to, you know, make a difference um, and try to spread awareness and educate people. And that's kind of how it all started. <laughs> it's crazy how social media can act as like a force and be like that community for everyone, like all around the world. And you're doing such a good job at it. I know our team like raves about your TikToks, because we're all like, like none of us really knew anything. Like we never learned about endometriosis like during school or anything like that. So it's still a topic that there's so much in misinformation out there, but then there's so many like different experiences. So I think everyone just is kind of confused about it. Um, so it's it was really nice to talk to you about it. And you said how your mom doesn't have endometriosis. Does anyone else in your family have endometriosis? I know that was like one of like the top questions from our inner cycle. Yeah. So my mom doesn't have endometriosis, but after my diagnosis, I found out that several of my aunts on my dad's side actually have endometriosis. So wow. I had no idea. Um, wow. But yeah, so it definitely, um, you know, you have a high chance of, you know, having it if it does run in your family, but it's not for sure. Um, but yeah, there is like some sort of genetic factor there for sure. Mm -hmm. And do you have any advice for any young menstruators who might think that they might have endometriosis? They're not sure. They're getting kind of turned away. Do you have any advice for them? 
Yeah. Um, you know, your period should never be like debilitatingly painful. And there's a lot of different things that it could be. It doesn't have to be endometriosis. You know, it could be PCOS, fibroids, adenomyosis. Um, you know, you could just have primary dysmenorrhea. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, if your periods are interfering with your daily life or, you know, you're in so much pain that you can't even function, um, you really need to communicate that with your doctor and be open and honest. I know a lot of us like feel like we have to kind of downplay it or like we're kind of nervous to be completely open and honest with our doctors, um, especially around menstruation and periods and stuff. Sometimes it's uncomfortable, um, but just be super honest with your doctors um, and express your concerns, you know, tell them you think it might be this, you know, and you want to look into that um, because, you know, you don't want to live like this forever, you know? Um, so just being really honest with your doctors. And if your doctor is continuously pushing you away, you know, gaslighting you, telling you it's like no big deal, you're just making it up in your head, blah, blah, blah. You know, you need to find a doctor that actually will listen to you and take your concerns seriously. And I know it might seem like there's not a lot of doctors out there that do that, um, but I promise they're out there if you if you look um, and keep trying. So just keep going, keep pushing and keep advocating for yourself. I love that advice. That's such a great advice because it's such a taboo topic. So I know everyone's kind of like, we're kind of moving into a space where we're trying to kind of destigmatize it. And your content is doing such a great job at that. It's creating a space to be more open with conversation and also just learning in like a really fun Gen Z way. Um, thank you so, so much for being a part of this. I'm definitely gonna be in contact with you because we wanna send you some goodies and, and we wanna do more, we wanna collab more. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm so excited to collab more in the future with you guys. Thanks for having me. Um, awesome, yeah. you, were, you were great. Thank you. Thanks, bye guys. Hi everyone. Joining us now on the period fields is Dr. Dan Martin, who is the scientific and medical director at the Endo Fund. Dr. Martin, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. It's an opportunity being with you. And I want to thank the August Sustainable Period Company for sponsoring this podcast on endometriosis. Oh, sweet. So before we get into some of our more technical questions about endometriosis, can you tell us a bit more about how you came to be the scientific and medical director and um, what does that position entail? Okay, so I retired, I'm 75 years old, be 76 next week. So I retired from med medicine, clinical medicine about six years ago and the Endometriosis Foundation needed a medical director, scientific director, to help work with some of the new advocacy programs. Endofound has been an advocate for women who have six to eight years delay, severe pain, and need surgery since, since 2009. More recently, we expanded into teenagers and school systems where the problems are different. We, we have so if you let a disease have six to eight years, six to 10 years to develop, it becomes a different problem than it was when it first started. And you right. don't approach it the same way in those two things. Right, right. So I guess what our community and menstruators really want to know is how would you break down and explain endometriosis for someone who's young and hasn't ever heard about it at all? So endometriosis is a condition where the tissue that normally lines the uterus grows outside the uterus. That tissue is called endometrium. When it grows outside the uterus or when similar tissue grows outside the uterus, it's called endometriosis. When it's found outside the uterus, if the immune system does not control it, it can continue to grow and interfere with uh, cramps, pain, and fertility. On the other hand, if the immune system does control it, it can be inactivated and left as an asymptomatic finding that causes no problems. Right. So, you know, menstruators are used to pain. So how do you think someone would differentiate that it's endometriosis or just like period pain? Like what are some of the signs and symptoms? In the beginning, the signs and symptoms are almost the same. Right. So there's no, no major difference between the two. As 
as the endometriosis gets worse, then the pain gets more severe and interferes with daily activities, school, work, other considerations. So when someone has cramps or pain that are that's controlled with ibuprofen, and they're not missing school or anything, I don't think there's any major concern. There's still some concern even then because not everyone has major pain. Right. However, if the pain is interfering with daily activities, if it's interfering with work, interfering with school, interfering with athletics, anything like that, consider there may be endometriosis and that you need to be evaluated for it. Right, right. So. Are there any solutions or treatments? This is like kind of like a daunting, you know, disease. So are there any kind of solutions or treatments? In, in the beginning, the treatment for endometriosis is the same as treatment for menstrual cramps. Right. Both have to do with estrogen. Both have to do with inflammation. Both have to do with cytokines and immunologic problems and endocrine problems. And both respond to estrogen suppression and anti-inflammatory medication. So the first thing we do with e either of them, whether it's just cramps or it's endometriosis, is try non anti-inflammatory agents to see if that will control the pain. If that controls the pain, and if the exam is normal, and there's no nodules and no cysts, then that's all that needs to be done except for having some sort of follow-up so that you, you know what you're going to do if things change. On the other hand, if those don't control it, then other alternative things like diet, yoga, those kind of things are worth considering. If none of those work, then surgery may be the only answer and seeing a provider to consider that may be the next step. Right. And why do you think this is so hard to diagnose? You know, when we talk about endometriosis occurring in 10% of women, about half of those have infertility and no significant pain. So all they know is that they don't, they just aren't getting pregnant with no other significant findings. About half have pain. So of that 5% who have pain, that's over a lifetime. That's about 0.2% per year. So if you take a pediatric practice that has about 1500 patients, about 800 of whom are female, and 0.1 to 0.2 percent per year. That's they only get to see one or two cases a year of this. Right. From a pediatric or primary care practice, they very rarely see it. It's it's like trying to find meningitis in the middle of flu season. Right. The symptoms yeah. the symptoms are very similar. Uh, it's just it's just the, the the similarity of the symptoms. And secondly, the normalization of pain in women, where you anticipate that cramps are going to be normal in a large number of women. It's just that severe cramps aren't. Right. So are there any resources or support groups or anything you would recommend to anyone who either has endometriosis or maybe going through the process or uh, thinking that they, they might have it? Yeah. EndoFound works closely with my endo team. They provide excellent, wonderful support to patients. They're, they're a great resource. You can find them on the web, website, which is www.endofound.org, or on Instagram, which is at endofound. That's awesome. Thank you so much for providing that information. And lastly, I know a lot of the conversation around, and around endo revolves around being misdiagnosed or getting turned away. What advice would you give to a menstruator who might be uh, going through this process? Be sure that someone has proactive plans for what you're going to do when pain does or does not get better. If it gets better, the plans aren't as necessary. You still need to have exams to make sure nothing's changing that you don't know about. But you need plans for if it's not getting worse, when's the next time you're supposed to be seen? You know, it's, it's not it, being told just to come back if you don't get better isn't good enough. You need some sort of planning for when you're supposed to be seen next. You need to have an understanding of when you're going to be using which type medications, when which type testing is going to be due, whether it's just going to be exams in the office, sonograms, MRIs, and some type consideration for when surgery might be considered. Right. 
And um, so I know your kind of, your role, what would you say the mission and the goal um, as a whole for the Endo Fund would be? Well, Endo Found, we strive to increase disease recognition, provide advocacy, facilitate expert surgical training, and fund research for endometriosis. We put particular emphasis on the critical importance of early diagnosis and effective in intervention while providing education to the next generation of professionals, their patients, and their children. Awesome, awesome. That's such a good resource to have. And I know there's so much misinformation out there. So getting to speak to you today is awesome for our community. It gives us some clarity and perspective. So thank you so much, Dan, for speaking with us today. Thank you for having me here. It's been a pleasure. Is there anywhere that our community can find you? Is there a website? Is there Instagram? Any socials that you'd like to shout out? No, I... I, I uh... My website is there. All my contact information is danmartinmd.com, just danmartinmd.com. I have a lot of educational material on that in addition to the educational material, which is at endofound.org. Awesome. Thank you so much. This is Dr. Dan Martin, the Scientific and Medical Director of the Endo Fund. So thank you so much for meeting and talking with me today. Thank you, Sam. It's been a pleasure.